Amen. All right. So Ecclesiastes chapter 5, I also want you to go and take and bookmark Psalm 128. So we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and Psalm 128, and I'm going to refer back to verses in both of these places throughout the whole sermon. So keep your place there, put a ribbon there, whatever you need to do. I mean, we're going to go other places, but those will be the main points. So Ecclesiastes, of course, I love the book of Ecclesiastes. I, I, it's one of my favorite, hands down, definitely top three books in the entire Bible. I love Ecclesiastes, and Ecclesiastes chapter 5 especially is, um, there is a lot of of sound financial advice in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And a lot of it may seem, if you've just read it for the first time or you haven't read it for a long time, it may seem confusing. He's talking about how things are bad and, you know, it's bad to be rich and all this kind of stuff. And then he says, oh, it's good and all this. But I want to explain all that to you this evening, how all that fits together with every other part of the Bible and how it's just great advice in the Bible. So we're talking about... Um, the financial series, and this is the close of the financial series of the fourth sermon, and we're going to be looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, but this evening I want to look at this idea of luxuries in our life. I want to look at the idea of luxuries in our life. Is it biblical? Are we supposed to have nice things? I've told you, you know, we've, let's just recap, you know, we talked about making a living. We talked about, um, we had a pre-sermon on diligence. If you remember that, I, I preached a sermon on diligence before we even got into the financial sermon. That's going to play in to this evening as well, and you'll start to see why that is. But we talked about budgeting your money, making a living. You make a living, you make enough money to support your family. Now you need to budget properly. You need to have your savings. And, you know, we talked a lot against things like luxuries, things that you don't need, non-essential things. We talked a lot against that. But the Bible actually speaks about that, and we're going to talk about it this evening. So we talked about making a living as you budget. You know that debt is bad and then, you know, you're not in debt. Instead, you have savings. But the Bible says that there is nothing wrong with enjoying the fruits of your labor. But it comes with some prerequisites and some things that we need to understand about it. And that's the, the, the great power of Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And I hope that after the, the sermon this evening, you'll go and you'll read Ecclesiastes chapter 5 again, and you'll see the contrast and how God in His Word is warning us. And he's, he's telling us about those things that we need to always keep in mind when we do what we're supposed to do. When we are good stewards of you know, the things that God has given us, which is a key right there, that we're good stewards of the things God's given us, we're going to have some, some blessings in our lives, but there's a lot of warnings and prerequisites that go along with that. So look down at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and look at verse number 18 to start off, okay? And let me just read verse 18 and verse 19 for you, and then I'll read for you Psalm 128, verses 1 and 2. You're there already. But then those are our core verses for the sermon this evening. So let's read. Verse uh, 18 of Ecclesiastes chapter 5, the Bible reads, Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. Now turn to Psalm chapter 128 and verse number 1, where the Bible says, Blessed is he... Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. And verse number two says, For, so we see a prerequisite here that you must walk in the ways of the Lord. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands, happy shall thou be, and it shall be well with thee. So look, here's the prerequisites that Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and, Ecclesi and, and Psalm 128 is talking about. In, in the Bible here, it's talking about the fruits of your labor, the good that comes from that. But the first thing that we need to remember is that everything comes from the Lord. Amen. Okay, is everything comes from the Lord. James 1.17 says, For every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Okay, John 3.27, we just read it this morning, said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. That's what John the Baptist said. 
Okay, those aren't red words in John 3, but maybe, you know, it's, it, those are words that, you know, as we read it this morning, you know, it just popped out at me because it, it, it fits with this sermon this evening. But every, a, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven, the Bible says. Okay, so look, that's a pretty powerful statement. You can, re you can receive nothing unless it is from heaven. So look very carefully at Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse number 18. And look at the end part of that verse. So what comes from the Lord? When I say everything, you're like, everything comes from the Lord. End of sermon, let's pray. No, but look at the very details of everything that it tells you that comes from the Lord. Look at the end of the verse where it says, All of his labor he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him. The days of your life God gives you. The days of your life. So look, what, the days that you live every single day has been given to you by God. Every day that you have is a gift, the Bible says. And God says also, if you follow this law, turn to Proverbs chapter 3. If you follow his law, notice in, in Psalm 128, I'm just going to keep bouncing back between these, so hopefully you have your finger or bookmark there. It says in Psalm 128, it talks about eating the labor of thine hands, but verse 1 speaks about this. It says that to, to those that walk in his ways, to those that walk in his ways, it's a prerequisite to enjoying the things that God has given you. So don't forget that. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 1. The Bible says, My son... Forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. So this is a, a, a parent talking to a child. Right? This is a parent talking to a child in Proverbs. It says, forget not my law. But what law is this parent talking about? Now I'm going to show you, turn to uh, Exodus chapter 20. I don't want to spend a lot of time about this. But look, the Bible says, you know, it talks about in Proverbs chapter 3, fearing the law of your parents, but it's relating that back to the law of God. Okay? Look at Exodus chapter 20 and verse number 12. And a lot of people are confused by this because, you know, there's, you know, you could, if you have parents that don't teach you the law or, you know, are going against the law of God, you know, then Exodus 20 and verse number 12 could be a little bit confusing. But the Bible says, Honor thy father and thy mother, and thy, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So that is relating honoring your father and mother to how long you will actually live in your life. Okay? But look, Romans 13 still applies. You know, we are to obey the higher power. So you're like, oh man, you know, what if my parents aren't saved? Or what if my parents, you know, want me to do things that are bad against God and all this kind of stuff? Look, it, it doesn't, it, you are to obey the higher powers. And we can see from Proverbs chapter 3, tying it to Exodus chapter 20, that when, in the, when, the, when the Bible was saying, my son, forget not my law, they're relating that to the law of God. That is talking about God's law. Okay, so look, the Bible relates following God's law to not only a long life, but the ability to enjoy the things in your life. Okay, so that's, um, that's just one um, side note. But look, the days of your life, the point, I'm back to the point, the days of your life are a gift. And by the way, this is a gift that everybody receives. So if you ever, you're ever out soul winning and you ever get this guy that's like, oh yeah, what's God ever done for me? You know, you get the guy that's standing in his front yard, you know, drinking a beer, and he's like, what's God ever done for me? Well, you're breathing, aren't you? You know, he gave you your life. He gave you your body, which you've already destroyed. He gave you your life, which you're wasting. But he gave you, you know, the breath that's in you right now. Even the unsaved, they have received this gift. They've already gotten it. Every unsaved person that has lived on this earth and died, even if they go to hell, they got the free gift of a, of a physical life on this earth. Amen. Okay, they already got that. So that's the answer to the guy that's like, what has God ever done for me? I mean, that's one answer. Okay, that's one answer. Here's another thing. Go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and look at verse number 18 again. Look at what the Bible says. Behold that which I have seen. It is good and comely for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life. So the Bible says to enjoy the good of what? It says to enjoy the good of your labor. And it relates that to also a gift. So the, the work that you have and the ability that you have to do that work 
is also a gift from God. Amen. Did you know that? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And look at verse number 4. The ability that you have, the job that you have, and you know the physical ability to get to that job, to do that job, whatever capacity you need to be successful at that job, to learn a skill, do that job, to make a living, all of that is a gift from God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. That's a great verse, because that says that you know, we're all going to be gifted in different areas. So some people are going to have gifts that other people aren't going to have. You know, some people maybe are very musical. Some people are very technical. Maybe some people are good at certain things. Some people, I mean, that's typically how people end up, especially men, in certain fields and not other fields. So they've been given gifts. I mean, there are different administrations with the same Lord. So that's saying if we're in a church and we're all saved, that we're all going to have different gifts. We're all going to have different abilities to do things. And, you know, but the same spirit. Right? So, I mean, that's something that, you know, we should never forget, right? And we talked a lot about these types of things, you know, casually this morning, but we should all have the same, I mean, we all do have the same spirit here. Amen. Okay? So, I mean, that is the, the beauty of the Christian life, is no matter what your abilities, what your talents, they are, it's, it's a gift from God, and we all have the same spirit. Okay? So the fact that you can get up and you can go to work every day is just, I mean, that's another gift that a lot of uns, that unsaved people get as well. The fact that unsaved people, you know, they can get up, they can go to work, they can make money. And look, some, some unsaved people are really good at this. They have a lot of ability. They have a lot of talent. You know, some people are really, really good at making money out in the world. They're not saved, but that's a gift from God all the same. It's a gift from God all the same. You think about a rich person. You know, they're just really good at just making tons of money. You know, it, it's, the Bible says it's a gift. It's a gift. Okay? Now look, your labor is also a gift. Your labor is also a gift. But I want to point out something that it is very clearly pointed out in Psalm 128 and in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 that is your personal labor. It is your personal labor. Look back at Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I mean, it talks about, you know, enjoying the fruit and the good of your labor. But it talks about it being yours personally for you to enjoy it. Look back at Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 18. I'm going to read it again. It is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy all the good, uh, the good of all his labor. It doesn't say to enjoy the good of somebody else's labor. Okay? It says his labor. And in Psalm 128, it's the same thing. In verse number 2, For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. That means your hands. Personally, you, singular, one person. It's talking about, you know, you can enjoy and eat the labor of your hands. You're supposed to eat the labor of your hands. So the blessing from the labor will only come if it's yours, the Bible says. Okay, and you're like, oh man, sorry. It has to be yours in order for this to work. The Bible gets us again, right? The Bible knocks communism down again. But the point is, there's a lot of things that the Bible says here are gifts from God, which is a prerequisite to what we're going to talk about this evening. And we see that it must also be yours. So what are the gifts? It's your actual, your actual physical life is a gift. Your actual ability to go to work is a gift. Your actual job or your place where you work or your, you know, the opportunity that you have to work somewhere is a gift. The Bible says. And then the good or the fruit of your personal labor is also a gift. These are all gifts from God. That's the first thing that we need to understand. So the title of the sermon this, this evening is Luxuries, right? Is, is tips on enjoying, having and enjoying luxuries in your life. You say, what are luxuries? Well, luxuries are, if you remember the last you know, sermon on budgeting. Lux luxuries are those things that are non-essential. The things that you don't need, right? The, the restaurants, the, the vacations, the, the extra vehicles, or whatever that you have, you know, basically wastes of money. If you think about it from a financial point of view, they're basically just things that are just wastes of money. Things with little to no 
financial return, if you want to think about it that way. Things you don't need, if you want to think about it that way. Ashley and I, every Saturday morning, before we come soul winning, we go and we get coffees together. And every single time, every single Saturday morning, it's $10.10. If you take that over a year, it's going to cost me 500 some dollars to have coffee with Ashley. It's a complete waste of money. It's a luxury. It's something that we don't need. It's something that, you know, we just decide to do. I just decide to do. Okay? So look, let me just give you a couple of tips on how to enjoy and have luxuries in your life biblically. Turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. So luxuries are those things that we don't need. They're the things in the budget that get cut first. If you, you can't budget properly and you, we don't have enough money and you're working through the budget, and you're doing all, these are the things you cut out. The luxuries. Okay? Turn to Galatians chapter 6. The first tip I want to give you on luxuries, and we saw the prerequisite on this is that you must always remember that everything is a gift from God. Amen. Everything is a gift from God. The first tip is this. You can't have everything right away. You can't have everything in your life right away. You say, that's obvious. Well, it's a common mistake today. It's a super common mistake to me today amongst young people especially. You know, this, this, this if you want to be in a financial position in the future or any time in your life, you must get rid of this attitude now or you will fail. This, I must have everything right now. This is, this is American. This is millennial. Or the next generation after that, Gen Y or Z or what are they even calling them anymore? But the point is, is that this have everything right now attitude will ruin you. If, if, you, if you can't get rid of it. If you feel like you need to have everything right now, you will never have anything, Amen. is the bottom line. You will, have ne well, you will have something, okay? You will have something, and what you will have is debt. And what you will have uh, is, is slavery. You're like, I'm against slavery. Me too. But you'll have it. If you can't get rid of that must-have-everything-right-now attitude, you will end up in slavery. You're like, slavery is illegal. You'll end up in it. You'll end up in financial slavery. So here's a prerequisite to financial success in your life. Look down at Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 9. You say, this is great advice, but you're just giving it to us. No, this is straight out of the Bible. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. If we faint not, let me read to you Romans chapter 8 and verse 25. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. You must have patience to be financially successful in this life. Okay, and now I understand that these are largely spiritual applications, but it works in your secular life as well. Amen. You must have patience. Everything that is, you know, in due season you shall reap, the Bible says. You need to have some patience in your life. In your Christian life, that's true. In your spiritual life, that's true. But it's true in your financial life as well. You must have patience. This is why we had the first sermon before this series even started. What was the sermon? It was on diligence. And what is diligence? It is persistent consistency. There is a time element to diligence. You have to be persistent over time. And you are diligent if you are that. If you work hard over time, you are diligent. Look, you're not diligent if you go and you hit it for a day and then you sleep for six. Okay? I mean, that's not diligence. There's a time element here. And look, that takes patience. That takes patience. The only way, listen very carefully, the only way, and this is the reason, and this is the reason that it, this series will not help a lot of you. The reason is this, because you have to, number one, understand the sermons of debt, of diligence, of debt, of making a living, which takes a plan that is a workable plan that you must execute of budgeting, 
And then you must execute that understanding over time, consistently. That's why a lot of you will not get much out of this series, or some of you, or whatever. I hope all of you do. But if you fail at having this change the way you are living your life, it's because you're not practicing it over time. If you get it right and you're like, oh yeah, we're not going to fast food restaurants and we're going to do this stuff and we're going to budget and we're going to be like this, and then two days go by and you're back to normal, it's a waste. Of your, it's a waste. It's a waste. I'm just a bunch of hot air up here, uh, you know, doing nothing for you. It must be practiced over time. That's the difficult part. Making a living. You have to hold a job over time. You have to hold a job. Like, one of the most important metrics that the secular world will use. Turn to Proverbs chapter 10. This is one of those things. Remember this morning? This is one of those things that even though somebody in the secular world that, said, that won't even claim to believe the Bible, they've figured this out. They know the Bible's true here. Even if they don't even know it's in the Bible. They know this is true because they've seen it be true so many times it becomes a literal business practice for them. Look at Proverbs chapter 10. The Bible says, he, that, he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. That's why if you walk into a bank and you want to get a, a loan for a home, one of the first questions they will ask you, they will ask you, they will ask you where you work, and then they will ask you, how long have you worked there? You know why they ask that? They're doing a diligence check on you. They're seeing how diligent you are. They're seeing, they're doing a Proverbs number 10 check on you. Because they know that somebody who's diligent, a good loan to a bank is an asset that a bank makes money on. If you take out a loan from a bank and you pay off that loan for years, pay on that loan for years and pay it off, they made money on you. You fulfilled that vow. You, I mean, it, it worked out well for both of you, hopefully. That's why people enter into a contract. But the point is they're doing a diligence check on you. Because if you take out a loan from them, they give you a bunch of money, and then you don't pay it back, they're going to lose a bunch of money on you. So they're trying to whittle down the losses that they have. They want to have as many W's over here as they possibly can and limit the L's. That's what they're trying to do. They're doing a Proverbs 10 check on you. Say that to your banker next time. You're doing a Proverbs 10 check on me. Be like, what? <laughs> but that's what they're doing. They're doing, they're seeing how diligent you are. Because the diligent will pay the loan back, is the bottom line. So look, the Bible's true whether you believe it or not. And people have figured this out. Right? So look, uh, making a living, getting into that job that makes you a living, getting into that job that makes you a living. Just getting into that job. Did you hear what I said? Getting into that job that makes you a living will take years. Years. You find any man in this church, any man wherever that makes a living, and I guarantee you it took him years to get to that point. He, 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 he paid his dues for years. I mean... Think of that, young people. That's what it takes. Think of that, young people, that, you know, you're like, I don't know if I should stay in this job for more than two months or whatever. Look, it, it takes years. Amen. It takes years. And look, if you don't be diligent in, in, in searching for that way to make a living, do you think God's going to open any doors for you? Amen. Do you think God is going to show you a path? How about you get diligent in your labor and pray that God opens doors for you, and I bet things happen for you. Amen. Budgeting. The, the third sermon. It takes budgeting over time. This is what will produce a situation where you actually have some savings if you budget over time. Budgeting for one month or one week a month will do you no good. Don't even try. You'll just frustrate yourself. So don't wonder why someone, by the way, since there's this time variable, and we're talking about patience, if you wonder, you know, don't wonder why somebody who's older, maybe your parents, whoever, you know, they've had more time to be diligent. They've had more time. You have to apply these lessons over time. And if you do that, if you do that in five years, 
in 10 years, you can afford some luxuries in your life. And the Bible says that that's okay. That's at, that is okay. So, look, that's all intro. Let's talk about enjoying the good of your labor. Look back at Ecclesiastes chapter 5. That's all, okay. that's all intro. This was all about how you get to that point. You know, you have to practice the first four sermons over time. You have to be diligent in every one of those things. You're like, sounds hard. Well, if it was easy, everybody would do it. That's why most people don't do it, because it's not easy. Look back at Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Look at verse 18. Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor. So here you are, you're living on 80%, maybe less if you're saving even more. You know, all your bills are paid every single month. You're giving 10% to the Lord. You're not robbing God. You know, you're, you're saving 10%, maybe more. And you have some money left over. It's like, hey, you can afford to waste some money at this point. You can afford to have some luxuries. And, and God's not against that. God's not against you enjoying the good of that labor. Okay, but look, here's a couple tips on those luxuries. Tip number one is this. Your luxuries... Men, married men with children and families, your luxuries should involve your family. Your luxuries should involve your family. Going to coffee with your kids, you know, camping with your kids, whatever. Things with your family. And it should not degrade any of God's law, Romans 13, always comes into play, any of God's law or your responsibilities as a husband, as a dad, or as a Christian in general. It should not dig into any of those responsibilities. I mean, don't be this married dad that is constantly just spending all his money on himself and running off with his single friends. I mean, don't be that guy. Because that's degrading your responsibilities as a leader of your home. I mean, look, you're, you're the one out working. And, and making money. But look, your wife is working in your family as well. And your wife deserves those same luxuries you know, that you do. I mean, she, you could make an argument that the wife raising the children is more important than you just making money. I mean, she has the, the care of the upbringing of the children in the home. I mean, that's a pretty big make or break situation. So everything, just remember, everything should center around your responsibilities as the leader of your family and your responsibilities to the Lord. Okay? I mean, you say, go on a vacation. You bring everybody. I mean, spend some time with your family. I mean, nothing, nothing I do on my own. I, I never do anything on my own. I would never go out and buy some sports car that I just enjoy by myself. It's all about something that I'm doing with my kids, and I try to make things as even as possible. If I go fishing with one kid, you know, I send the girls horse riding or something like that. The luxuries should be shared by the whole family. And, I mean, ideally, most of the luxuries should be done together. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And then even Ecclesiastes, but just go to Matthew chapter 7. Ecclesiastes 5.13, I'll just read for you. The Bible says there's a sore evil. I mean, so it's talking about evils in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 as well. Evils of riches. Evils of, you know, things, right? There's a sore evil which I've seen under the sun, namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. So if you're just, like, hoarding all these riches and all these, you know, things that, you know, all these luxuries for yourself, look, that's just going to be to your hurt, if it's a selfish thing for you, that's going to be to your hurt. And you say, who are you holding it for? Look at the next verse. But those riches perish by evil travail, and he begeth, begetteth a son, and there is nothing in his hand. So he's, given, he's like, he just took it all for himself, and he's like providing nothing for his children. It's like, that is not what Ecclesiastes chapter 5 is talking about. So there's all these 
prerequisites and clauses and all these different things in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Hey, it's great to have labor and to do what you're supposed to do and to end up with some things that are extra. God wants you to have those blessings, but he wants you to use it for the, the, the greater, for his kingdom. He wants you to use it for your family. He wants you to provide for your children. He wants you to use it for something other than just yourself. What happened to the guy that built the barns and just looked at the barns and he was like, look at how awesome I am. God killed him. It wasn't the barns. It wasn't because they were full. There was plenty of rich people in the Bible that God just blessed and blessed and blessed. And it was fine. It wasn't the barns or the fact that they were full. It wasn't the storehouses. It was that he was just, look at me. Look what I've done. I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry. That was the problem. He kept them to his own hurt. And in that case, death. I mean, so it's, I mean, there's some pretty big clauses that we don't want to miss in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. That's why you have to read the Bible. You, have to, you can't just take verses in the Bible and say, oh, see, God wants me to be happy, you know, and just whatever I want. You know, I mean, look, you have to read the Bible. Amen. You have to understand what you're reading. The Bible's a complicated book. There's all these things in there that are, you know, they don't contradict each other. And there's all these clauses in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 that's like, hey, these are all good, but this, 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 and this. Pay attention. I mean, the guy died in his sleep. Look at, uh, where are you at? Matthew 7? Look at Matthew 7. Look at what the Bible says. So this is kind of comparing God to the kind of parents that we should be and, talk, and just looking at, you know, um, well, let's just read it. The Bible says, For everyone that, that's, that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. I'm still seeing a, a, a white spot from that headlight. That was really bright. I'm sorry for shining that in your face, brother. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing a white spot on the pulpit here. Anyway, or that what man is there of you if his son ask bread will give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish will give him a serpent? So he's saying, what man, what kind of what bad person if a son asks him for you know, something would just give him a rock or give him a stone or whatever? He said, if, he, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, say even the worst of you know how to give good gifts unto your children, is what he's saying. How much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? So look, it's talking about praying here and asking things of your heavenly Father, but he's comparing it to how like a normal man should want to give gifts to their children, should want to provide things for their children. So you shouldn't just you know, think that you have some extra, have some luxuries, and just hoard all that to yourself. That would be a terrible thing that God will come down on you for. So look, luxuries should be spent on the family. Things that can make, I mean, why not spend them on things that can make your family stronger? Spend time together. You know, get activities going. Look, I own some things that from a financial perspective are a complete waste of money. But here's the thing. You know what another luxury is? Another luxury that you will end up with if you are diligent in your life, another luxury you'll end up with is this thing called time. You will be able to trade money for time. Amen. And let me tell you something, especially those, you know, there's a lot of people here with little kids. You're going to blink your eyes and those kids are going to be 19. And you're going to be like, what in the world happened there? These kids that I'm looking at here are going to be 19, just like that. And you will wish, you will never say, we spent too much time together. So you know what? Here's another reason. You know, just to get away from this idea of, of storing up bank accounts and investments and all these types of things, if you are diligent and you do the things in this sermon series diligently over time you will have time you will have time and you will be able to spend that time because let me tell you something you will never find somebody that says I spent too much time with my family I spent we went, we, went on, we went on too many hunting trips. We went on too many camping trips together. We spent too much time together. I spent too much time with this child and too much time. No, I spent too much time with my wife. You'll never find somebody that says that because time goes too fast and there's never enough of it. I mean, our lives are a vapor, the Bible says. We can't get this back. James 4.14, whereas you know that shall, what shall be on the, tomorrow, on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. So look, there is nothing, there is absolutely 
nothing wrong with enjoying the fruit of your labor. But it comes with all these warnings and side notes and prerequisites. And you need to use it in a way that strengthens and not separates your family, that strengthens your relationship to the Lord. You know, look, you can't have some luxuries and then, and then use those luxuries and that luxury of time that you have to all of a sudden you know, get out of church and all of a sudden stop doing the first works. And, and, and look, it's not going to go well for you because in the end, you'll turn those blessings of your life into curses. I mean, that is the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon, that's exactly what he, he did. God gave him everything. God gave him wisdom. God gave him riches. He gave him everything. Solomon was a very wise child and a very humble child when he took over the kingdom. And he asked God, he won, I mean, he won God's heart right away. And God said, I'm just going to give you everything. I'm just going to give you everything even though you didn't ask for it. Because you didn't ask for it, I'm going to give you everything. But look back now at Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And look at verse number 10. So Ecclesiastes chapter 5, I'm proving to you, shows that you can, hey, you can enjoy the blessings of your life. Right? You can enjoy. You can work hard. You can make money. You can save money. And you can enjoy all that. And God wants that. Amen. God wants you to enjoy it. But He doesn't want you to turn on Him. He doesn't want you to use it to your, yourself. To your own. He's like, because if you use it to yourself, any clean... In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, he's like, enjoy the good. Don't use it to yourself, or that'll be to your own hurt. Why? Because God will hurt you. Don't use it to your own hurt. And then look at verse number 10. In the same chapter. You think it's a, a coincidence that it's all in the same chapter? That there's this point in the Bible where God... You think God, maybe God knew that people would read a verse that says, hey, enjoy all the good of your labor. People were like, yes! I can do whatever I want. It's okay to just go get rich and just forget the Lord. Just go get rich and just forget my family. And all this. No, God puts all this stuff in here in the same chapter. So we don't get confused, yet we still will get confused. Look at verse 10. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. That's an interesting little curveball. If you start to love money, you'll never be satisfied by it. I mean, who do you think invented that? rule, that law of nature. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a natural law right there. If you start to love the bank accounts and the stuff and the whatever, the cars or the, the houses, and you start to love all this stuff, it'll never satisfy you. I remember when we lived in Texas, we just first moved there. And we, my wife and I, we didn't have any kids. We, we both worked. I mean, we never, you know, we never had money like this. We, you know, we didn't have, I mean, we didn't have a lot, but I mean, we didn't have, we never made money before. And now we're both working and all this. And, and like, we had friends. And when we knew, my wife and I knew that when we had kids, that, that she was going to stay home with the kids. I wasn't even saved, but I had this right. I mean, I had some things right. And so we bought a house that, would be, that could be supported by just my salary alone. And we had all these friends that were just, you know, they were, they were single, or not, they weren't single, but they were married and didn't have children. They were buying these huge houses. And look, they would buy a huge house. You don't know the kind of mansion you can buy in Texas for, you know, the, I mean, the price, what you can buy a, a dog house for in California. But... <laughs> The, the point is, they had all these big houses, and then like all they, could, all they cared about after they got into that house was the next neighborhood that they wanted to move into. They didn't even, they didn't even enjoy the house that they lived in. It was just about, oh, so-and-so moved into this neighborhood, and so-and-so. I mean, it was terrible. Like They didn't even enjoy what they had. But look at you know, Ecclesiastes 5.10. They'll never be satisfied by silver. They'll never be satisfied by it. Nor he that loveth abundeth with increase. This is also vanity. So as you do these things, and look, I have talked to some of you very specifically about this. If you come to me and you want detailed advice on how to put these sermons into practice in your life, I will help you. And I will, I will guide you. 
And I will show you. I will show you how to save and help you with all these different technical details of what you have to do. How to, how to work hard and give you, you know, some advice on that, making a living and all this. Whatever you want. But I will always say, as you plan your lives, and as you do this, you are going to end up with stuff five years down the road, ten years down the road. You're going to have something there. But don't you get obsessed with this stuff. You always keep a warning about this. You know, you just, you get your account set up. You get your automatic transfers set up. You get your job career going and working hard. And then you set it and forget it. And you don't let it affect your Christian life. You don't let it affect or derail anything of what you're doing today. If anything, it should make you stronger here. And then you know you're doing it right. So be very, very careful. Because what will happen is, when it says, you know, he that loveth silver, that means your heart goes into it. Your heart always needs to be here. Your heart always needs to be with the Lord. Your heart always needs to be with your family and pushing, you know, your family in, you know, the things of the Lord. And the minute you see something like that starting to pull you away from that, that is a huge warning sign. You need to recognize that. Look, it's just, it's just money. And at the end of the day, look, you have to have it. You have to have it to make a living, to support your family. That's a command from God. If, if, if you don't support your family, you're worse than an infidel. There's strong language in the Bible about this. But it, look, it's all going to burn. It's all going to burn in the end. So do it right, but your heart can't go there. Because if your heart does go there... You're going to turn those blessings into curses. And that is where, you know, the treasures of darkness will come in for you. And what did God do to Belshazzar with his treasures of darkness? You know, go read on Babylon sometime. It was one of the richest cities. I mean, they talk about how Babylon was, I don't know if it was 20 miles by 20 miles. This city was huge, golden everything, hanging gardens, all these different massive riches everywhere. Yet, he had to pull the, the cups and everything from the house of God to have a party. You don't think he had golden everything everywhere? He had to blaspheme God. It wasn't good enough. And he had to turn those treasures that his grandfather had, who, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, God humbled him, and he, he got saved. But he turned those treasures into treasures of darkness, and God took them away and gave them to somebody else. So don't turn your treasures, your blessings, into treasures of darkness. darkness. That, you know, things that basically will steal your, your heart from the Lord. You know, Ecclesiastes, you can think about Ecclesiastes, just the book of Ecclesiastes, it's pretty amazing, right? I mean, it's pretty amazing when you think about Ecclesiastes. You have a man who started out a very young king, probably, you know, less than 20 years old, and he started out a young king. He did some good things. He, you know, he was a humble, started out humble as a young, he was a humble young man. I mean, what in the world? Who can find one of those? I'm just kidding, guys. But the, the point is, he was a humble young man. He was a humble young man, and God blessed him greatly, and then he just turned his back on God. He married all these wives. I mean, he even started building temples for all his wives, for all these other gods. I mean, he just totally messed up his life. I mean, look at verse number uh, 17 of chapter 2. What did he say? I mean, you think about Solomon. You think about Solomon is the only person in the history of the world that I can think of that actually won the Keeping Up with the Joneses game. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, he's sitting there and he's giving you this big list of all these things that he did. He's like, I had this and I had this and whatever. He's like, whatever my eyes wanted, I had. I, I spared, you know, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't, you know, keep anything from myself. Whatever I wanted, I had it. Whatever I wanted, I got. He's like, and then he says, I had more than anybody that was before me. It's like he literally had more than anybody. He's like, keeping up with the Joneses, won it. He won the game. Verse 17, therefore, I hated life. He hated his life. Isn't that, don't we see that today? Yeah. Don't we see that with all these, all, these, all these people that just push to be rich and all these rich people right. that end up committing suicide yeah. or end up having their kids? I mean, hey, hey, you're rich. That's great. Your kid killed himself. Oh, 
I wonder how much money they would pay to have that not happen. You think, oh man, you know, these people with these big yachts and just like, what must that be like to live that life? I remember Jacob and I were out fishing and we're cleaning fish in the back of our boat. And there's like this big 128 foot yacht that parks there and they're all looking down on us as I'm cleaning fish and like my, my, my skipjack, you know? And, and, and they're just like, and I'm just like, you know what? You wish you were here. That's what I was thinking. You wish you were here, you know, covered in fish guts with your son is what you think, is what you wish. But look, there's nothing wrong with being rich in itself, but he that will be rich will fall into a snare, is what the Bible says. He that will be rich, when it says that, it means you have, it doesn't mean he that will be rich, like you're going to be rich. It means that he that has the will to be rich. Look, I don't have the will to be rich. God doesn't want me to be rich. I already know that personally. Look, I have the will to work hard. I have the will to trust the Lord. I have the will to thank God for the blessings that he's given me. And, and use those for the Lord and for my family Amen. to serve the Lord and to raise children that will, that will grow up to serve the Lord. That, that's the will I have. But if you have the will to be rich, you're not going to be satisfied even when you do get rich. So you have to, you have to guard yourself here. Make sure that these things that God's going to bless you with, just, just let the blessings come. Thank God for the blessings and just keep moving forward in your Christian life. Amen. That, that's what you do. Amen. Joy, true joy comes from the Lord. Amen. True joy comes from the Lord. Always remember this. So look, in closing in this financial series, I, I, I hope you listen and understood, it, but it's easy to understand really. I, I don't think that I preached anything in these four sermons, these five sermons, that was super hard to understand. But it's really hard to implement. And there's a reason that I'm saying this over and over and over again, because I want you to implement it. It's hard to implement. Go home, you know, if you go home and you wonder, you know, why are things not going the way I want? Why can't I pay the bills? Why can't I hold the job? Why can't I get a good job? You just need to go home and just watch this series again. You need to get diligent. You need to think about debt and how serious that is to your life and how that will, it will literally put you in slavery. You know, I mean, think about all the, the, I mean, if you walked around and you're like, hey, I think slavery is good today, I mean, people will go crazy. People will go crazy. I mean, slavery, you say the word slavery and people like would just freak out because slavery is, I mean, such a hot topic uh, even today over, you know, slavery. Yet, People just put themselves in slavery all the time, voluntarily. Look, it's real, folks. It's real slavery. If you end up buried in debt, the slavery will be very real to you. You will suffer. You will suffer physically from debt. Do you understand how serious it is? That is why the Bible talks about it. Because guess what? It's natural law. It doesn't have anything to do with what the political climate is at the time. If you get into debt, you will be in slavery. Natural law. It's just going to happen to you. It doesn't matter when you lived. It doesn't matter. You know, look, now is probably the best time you could live and get into debt. But you will still be in slavery even in this country. Even if they don't throw you in prison, you will feel like you were in prison. You will feel like it. Like I said, imagine going to work every single day to make payments that are just interest payments that aren't even paying off loans on things that you don't even have. That's where people end up getting. People that go up and run up a bunch of credit cards and go on a bunch of vacations and want to have everything right now. They end up, what a terrible life. People commit suicide over stuff like this. I mean, it's that serious. It is slavery. You know, budgeting. I hope you, you look at what your budget is every single month and get this figured out. Or you've just got a boat that's got holes in it and you're going to sink. And you're going to end up in slavery. Because if you don't have enough money to cover your bills, you're going to end up in debt. And then if you get all these things right, maybe you'll have some luxuries. And God wants you to have that. God wants you to enjoy the good things from your labor. The fact that you can get up every morning, man, man when, you, when you complain about your work and you want to complain about your job, you think about the fact that God has even allowed you to go and have a job. Yep. Right. 
I mean, that is one of the big takeaways for me this year, is I'm so thankful that God has allowed me to have a job. I am so thankful that, that the, the men in this church and that, that you know, people in this church have, have been able to have a job and have been able to just continue having that blessing from God to go and labor and go and work and go and, and be able to do that, to have that ability. It's all a blessing from God. But of course, they that will be rich will fall into temptation and a snare. So as you get it right, then as God blesses you, you know, don't go, I mean, look, many people in the Bible were rich. Being rich is not a problem unless you make it one, unless you use it to turn against God. David, Abraham, Joseph, think about all these people. I mean, they had, they, they had all kinds of increase. God just kept giving them more and more. Everything's a gift, enjoy it, but remember from whence it came is the key. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.